Uh, so our next panel uh, deals with uh, community engagement. It's a very important thing if we're going to be doing work in urban areas, we need to be able to engage with the community in urban areas. And we could have no better moderator for this panel than uh, Marlo Rencher. Marlo I met at TEDx 2012. She's an outstanding person. She's been working in this area. She's an entrepreneur. She has her PhD in business anthropology from Wayne State University. Uh, she has undergraduate degrees from the University of Michigan here. Go blue. And uh, let's see, um, Marlo, I have, to, I have to read this because Marlo just took on a new job. So she's a co-founder of a company called Snapshore, but she's also the executive director of the Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Cleary University. So I will introduce Marlo and let her introduce her panel. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. So um, as uh, David talked about, I'm, uh, I'm a business anthropologist. So it's very, very, very important to us to make sure that we're talking to the community. Um, and there could be really no better uh, panelists to talk about talking to the community than the ones we have selected. We have a really great mix of people who are entrepreneurs as well as people who are academics. And let me um, really do uh, us the great favor of getting them to the stage very quickly so we can engage with them um, about the wonderful things that they're doing. So first we have Brian Flanagan, who's the managing director of the University of Michigan Ross Leadership Initiative. Brian, come on up. <laughs> Next. Um, we have Sebastian Jackson, who's the founder of the Social Grooming Company in Detroit. Come on up. Awesome. Next, we have Christopher Prater, who's the co-owner of Thrift on the Avenue, the wonderful store you saw uh, a little bit earlier on the screen. <laughs> Last, but certainly not least, we have Nick Tobier, who's the associate professor at the U of M Penny W. Stamp School of Art and Design. Come on up. So we'll get started with Brian. Okay. Great. Well, first of all, thanks for having us here today. It's a real pleasure to, to be a part of a conversation like this, and it's something that we're all very passionate about and excited to engage with. So um, I'm, again, a representative of the Ross School of Business, and our mission at the Ross School is educating business leaders who make a positive difference in the world. Uh, so it's sort of a unique mission. And what that means to us is we're trying to train business leaders uh, who are very purpose-driven, who are committed to adding economic value for shareholders, stakeholders, and society, um, people who build businesses that are great places to work and proactive citizens in the community. And uh, I think the reason I'm actually on stage today is one of our particular initiatives that, that my group, the Ross Leadership Initiative, runs uh, that is trying to really introduce students and into this space and into this ethos. So we, we do this thing each year called the Ross Impact Challenge. Uh, students participate in this before they even start class. It's the first experience for MBA students. It's one of the first for our BBAs. We engage 1,500 students across five academic programs in this initiative. And really what it's doing is actually getting students involved in, in urban entrepreneurship and introducing them to this notion that uh, we can create for-profit businesses serving a social purpose in the community. And so last year, uh, the form that took is we <clears throat> put together a back-to-school fair. Our students generated 42 different products, services, learning activities tailored to the unique needs of Detroit youth. And I'll talk a little bit about how they came to understand those needs in a moment. Um, and it was a big energized event. We had 3,000 kids in Detroit Eastern Market with their family members. Uh, it was a great engagement and really showed us what we could potentially do with this program. Um, since then, we've taken it to a new level. This year, again, since May, we've been engaging with 1,500 students in five different phases. And in each case, getting them to engage with the community to go through a user-centered design process where they're talking with end users about what kind of a business we can create that would serve a real important need. And so the mission this year was actually to create a business venture idea uh, that we were going to invest in as a community. And by invest, I mean we have, um, we have investment from General Motors, investment from our provost office, so we can actually seed fund a new venture. Um, and so this year's purpose was to create a business 
that would increase the odds Detroit youth, this next generation of Detroiters, could become in, engaged in this entrepreneurial space. Um, and so what we've gotten really good about uh, is engaging community in that brainstorming process and the development of the idea and the selection of the ultimate idea. Uh, what we're getting better about is, is uh, really engaging the community in that earlier stage of identifying the needs. Uh, but uh, I'm sure we'll have time to get a little further into it, but um, what Marlo asked me to be clear about is sort of our assumptions going into the community. And being from the University of Michigan and being with the business school, uh, we know we have to go the extra mile to really build trust in the community and to make sure people know we're there for authentic reasons, to follow through on the things we say we're going to do, um, and to start with some really good partners. So people like Bart Eddy, who's in the audience today, Tech Town Detroit, who you're going to hear from later, Detroit Parent Network, Detroit Public Schools. Um, we've started to create a really robust set of partners, and we've started to get much better about sustaining our presence and our commitment in the city. Uh, and I think if we get to the point where this impact challenge each year is engaging these hundreds of students in a meaningful way with community leaders, business owners, other stakeholders, and we're truly creating these new business ventures each year that serve a social need, uh, we'll only go further in building that trust and seeing, helping people see that we're serious about it. Um, so I know we're short on time and I don't want to take up much more. I'll leave it at that. Happy to share more about the impact challenge and how we engage the community in that process. My name is Sebastian Jackson, and I am the founder of The Social Club. Uh, the Social Club is a barbershop that impacts community and the natural environment. Um, so what does that mean? It's a barbershop first. We focus on cutting hair, uh, all different types of hair. I made it uh, a decision to hire people that look different than me, so everybody that works there uh, looks different than each other, so that we can cut all different types of hair. Uh, that, that's one way that we impact the community by engaging all different types of the community so that we can kind of break some of these racial barriers that exist. And because everybody needs a haircut, this is a place that they can come and engage, right? Um, how else would you, do we impact the community? So we built our barbershop out of a house uh, that, that, that was uh, blighted, burned down, right? We, we, we work with Jerry Paffendorf, uh, who, who, you know, uh, is, is, is one of the reasons why uh, why don't we own this exist, right? So we identify one of these blighted homes that was burned down, deconstructed it piece by piece, and built our barbershop out of that house. Uh, our barbershop is located on the main campus of Wayne State University. Um, and that was another way we wanted to impact the natural environment as well, right? We, did, we didn't want to use wood from a tree or from, you know, Lowe's or Home Depot. We wanted to use sustainable materials. Um, and the second piece of us impacting the environment is all the hair that we cut, uh, we recycle that hair and use it in compost to grow trees around the city of Detroit. Hair is made up of 15% nitrogen, which is uh, a natural fertilizer. You know, it, it helps with the composting process uh, as that compost breaks down uh, and the hair is that nitrogen support for that tree. We found that uh, every month we collect about 12 pounds of hair, which is enough hair to support the growth of 10 trees uh, for that first year. Um, so the idea here is to, you know, take what has existed uh, in, in my community forever, right, the barbershop experience, uh, and turn that into something that impacts the community and natural environment um, through, through breaking racial barriers, uh, through taking the hair clippings and impacting the environment uh, directly. Uh, and then we do these, thing called, these things called shop talks, uh, which is essentially a panel discussion where we have local and global innovators come together, sit in the barber chair while getting their haircut, telling their story. What do you do? How did you get into it and why? And, you know, we've had people like Dwele, who's a Grammy Award winning artist, come in and tell his story. Uh, we've had Jamie Shea, who's, you know, uh, worked with Mission Throttle, you know, venture capitalist. Uh, and and it's, 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 it's because we're on Wayne State's campus that we kind of get this array of diverse clients, uh, but they have these questions. They want to know, you know, what do you do and why, right? And, and in the barbershop, we've had, we have these questions, we have these debates, uh, but it's no, it's no context, it's no kind of system, and we've decided to take this traditional experience and kind of give it some form, uh, and, and have a moderator and ask these questions and, and have these, these answers that are, that are, that are factual, uh, uh, versus, you know, uh, you know, hearsay. 
Uh, so that's the environment that we're looking to create. Uh, right now we have one shop. We're looking to open up two more. Uh, we've gained some interest from Reggie Bush. He wants to invest in helping us get two more shops open. And after we do that, then we plan on franchising this opportunity so that we can scale our impact uh, and scale our community engagement. Um, eventually, we want to have these shop talks online so that we're not limited by the capacity of our shops. And some of these stories that are being told uh, can impact a greater audience. And we want to turn that 12 pounds of hair in one shop into 1,200 pounds of hair you know, in 100 shops and planting 1,000 trees a month. Uh, so we're looking to scale our impact. Uh, that's what we do, how we do it, and why we do it. Excellent. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Christopher Prater. I uh, uh, own Thrift on the Avenue along with my wife, Tanisha, and our partner, Jessica Glenn. Uh, I wish that I could say that uh, owning a resale store saves trees and lives, but I, don't, <laughs> I think I'll be embellishing that. Uh, I, I tell you, uh, a small story about me. I am one of 14 children in my immediate family. I come from uh, uh, same mother, same father, six brothers, seven sisters, seven right hand, seven left hand, seven dark skin, seven life hand. I mean, it's <laughs> kind of crazy. Um, my father was um, um, a salaried employee with Ford Motor Company for 37 years, and uh, whereas he made a very good income, Bringing that check home and dividing it 16 different ways every week is, you know, pretty creative at, at one point. Uh, and then when you're a, a, a kid going to school every day with, uh, resale clothes on, that's a, another challenge, you know, <laughs> and the Detroit public school system getting teased every day. So long before, uh, Ryan, uh, what's his name? Ryan Leslie and Macklemore made the thrift song popular. Oh, I was the guy rocking my grandfather's socks. That was, that was me. <laughs> Uh, uh, fast forward some 20 years later, I uh, meet a young girl who is a only child and she marries into my family of 14. And, you know, my family now college educated and doing well. Uh, they still shop at, at thrift and resale shops. So my sisters, love them to death, got my wife, uh, addicted and she has been turned out ever since then. Um, we started Thrift on the Avenue. I wish I could say it was a, a lot of planning that went into it, but really my my wife and my sister-in-law had a brand called the Thrifty Bras where they show women how to uh, to look good without paying a lot of money. Matter of fact, the tagline is looking fabulous doesn't have to break the bank. And so we were partnered up with, you know, different, uh, I'm going to back up, I don't want to use the partners yet, but we were supporting a lot of thrift and resale stores and, you know, me doing the math is like, hey, we, we were spending a lot of money and marketing towards these organizations where the impact um, we can't really quantify. Everybody says, they, you know, we support this charity and this charity. But uh, after seeing uh, a CNBC uh, a story about one of the major uh, thrift stores and their business model, you know, it brought tears to my eyes. And I said, hey, listen. We can do this, and the amount of money that just my wife and my sister spent alone, we could be successful if they shop there, but we could have a direct impact on where those dollars go. Uh, we spent 12 years in Atlanta, Georgia, although we're native Detroiters, and we moved home about two years ago. We uh, uh, submitted to a grant through the uh, DGC called, uh, program called Revolve, and we were awarded a $10,000 grant to start uh, Thrift on the Avenue. Uh, fast forward to about a week within us opening, we found out that due to a zoning ordinance, we could not open up at our original location. So after crying and praying, more crying is like, you know, what are we going to do? Uh, a consultant of a friend of ours, uh, Dorothy Perto, who is a U of M alumni, um, she said, I have this spot for you to look at on Cass Avenue. And I said, Dorothy, I'm not going on Cass Avenue. I'm telling you that right now. And uh, she said, no, you got to check out this spot on Cass Avenue. I said, Dorothy, you're from California. You don't know anything about Detroit. I'm not going to Cass Avenue. So after much urging, uh, uh, I came down to Cass Avenue, and I thought that I was literally out of town. I said, you know, where? I had no idea that all this had development had taken place since we had been gone. Um, so what you guys understand and know as Midtown, uh, I knew as Cass Corridor. 
So in terms of sustainability and making a, a urban impact, it was important to us to partner up with one of the longest institutions that's been there, which is the Coalition of Temporary Shelters. Um, being a clothing store is one thing. I, I don't think it takes much brain work to do that. Uh, but as Detroit continues on its path of resurgence and uh, its renaissance, uh, we've heard it a million times that you, you don't you can't you don't know where you're going until you know where you come from. And it it I would be remiss uh, for me to be in business in Midtown and not bring along one of the most prominent um, fixtures in that part of the uh, of the city. Uh, the Coalition Temporary Shelters. And one of the things that we do is a lot of times they have issues with raising funds because people say, I'm not going to contribute because everybody there is uh, some dropout, dope, you know, dope pushing user, loser. The reality of it is that homelessness is a transition. You know, one or two bad decisions and any one of us in this room could find ourselves in a similar situation. So, we partner with them to raise awareness to how people become consumers of cots. And by finding that out, you could, you know, find out that someone is there because they may be a veteran that's suffering from PTSD or uh, could be a victim of domestic violence. Uh, and so it's just not a, a, a cause or the sum of riotous living. It could just be, you know, a bad situation. And so that is our impact or what we are most, we, we hang our hat on because that's most important, not just selling a nice dress that you could find in any markets. You could find for us for $10. It's that 30% of all of our profits are going back to help the community and, and, and bring them along in this redevelopment process. So thank you guys very much. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nick Tobier. I am a faculty member here at the School of Art and Design and the College of Entrepreneurship. And I teach a number of courses and most focus around communities in Detroit. And in fact, uh, Fresh Corner Cafe had started in one of those classes as Get Fresh Detroit, and I'm so glad it's still going on. Let me tell you a little bit about how I got to that. I think that might be useful in because we talked about why are some of these questions specific to an urban context. So I largely, for the last 10 years, I've been working in Detroit, taking students from the University of Michigan campus to Detroit. I grew up in a part of New York City that looked a lot like the parts of Detroit that I work in. And I understood the environment that surrounded me to be hostile and violent and unpredictable. And I wanted to get out of there as fast as possible. And I used education as the way to get out. And I am concerned deeply that if our best and our brightest students see their communities as places to get out of, and that education is separate from the community, and those students go perpetually to the centers, whether they are New York or Los Angeles or Chicago, we perpetually disadvantage those places that need our brightest the most. So I work largely in Brightmoor with my kindred spirit, Bart Eddy, who is here as well. And some of the things that I am concerned with and occupy most of my time is building the capacity of those young people to see themselves as powerful enough to shape their environment in a way that reflects their, their largest ambitions. And in that shaping, they do not have to leave. And that ideally we build our schools as places that are places for resilient communities to thrive and flourish. And we can see that contribution come back. So as much as possible, if I can try and summarize some of the things that we do, I bring a variety of University of Michigan students, a mix of engineering, business, sociology, art and design, to work together with this year, a ninth grade class. We get together, we talk a lot, we play, kick, we play kickball, we talk about how we get to school, we talk about the things that we love, the foods that we hate, and the best is when those relationships start to form, when we're not worried about a task, but we get to know one another as individuals. And we co-create projects that will have an impact on the school and potentially on the neighborhood, but most importantly, on the lives of the young people who are creating them. So a number of years ago, a group of U of M and Detroit Community High students started a project called um, Detroit Community Apparel. They won the Detroit Soup Competition, a microfunding grant. It happened that NBC Nightly News was there that night. They got interviewed by the Brian Williams Show, as well as a French television network that 
I don't think really spoke English. You have to somehow watch this interview at some time. There's a lot of smiling, holding up a t-shirt. But, but now, four years later, the students who were freshmen in high school are running that project. So they know everything. They know the design process. They know how to burn the screens. They know the marketing. And that's our greatest aspiration, or at least mine, is if I can build the capacity of these two groups of students to work together to co-create those projects so I can get out of their way and let them own that process, then they are the next generation of leaders. We have projects that have failed, and I'm so happy that they fail epically. So there was a group that built a mobile pizza oven out of steel, and it got so hot so fast you couldn't get near it, but it could cook a pizza like no tomorrow once you got that fire going. <laughs> but you didn't want to go near it, so there's a problem there. But we learned that in December. Nobody wanted to go outside and work on it. So we look over and over for things where, where can we be resourceful? Right now, the students are building bus benches out of wood that we've salvaged in the neighborhood. And when you see a ninth grade girl who's never held a hammer or a saw, who says at the beginning, uh-uh, I'm not going to do that, does it at the end of the day, feels that they can do it. We're not teaching saw work or woodworking or hammering, but we're teaching confidence and building that capacity. So as a teacher, as an educator, what I have learned is most important to me is to train my students as best possible to turn their sense of privilege inside out. We talked a lot about how, what are the communities that we engage with and when Marlo and I spoke. So the communities are, are multifold. There's the University of Michigan students who largely come from communities of privilege, many of whom come from the surrounding suburbs and have a very complex uh, relationship with the city of Detroit, some of which comes from parental um, misgivings or antagonism or guilt or all sorts of things that said Detroit used to be great and then we moved out to Bloomfield Hills and don't go in there. All sorts of things that come in that process of deconstructing the privileges that come with race and class. And those, once we can help under, understand and unpack some of those, then we can understand our partners as individuals and our communities as complex because the same ninth grade students have multiple identities. They're brothers, they're sisters, they're cr Christians, they're athletes, whatever it is. And when we can start to understand each other's individuals, the things that we create together will stick because they come from places that have something uh, that's a core value or an ideal. We teach various business practices, understanding a business model canvas, and what it means to create, say, a project that deals with the identity. The silk screen came from the fact that the students wore school uniforms and they wanted to see themselves and their ideals reflected in the clothes that they wore. So once they can start to shape that process, they recognize that, that, that there's no stopping what they can do and the agency that they gather from that process enables all of our communities to grow together because we get a lot of things out in the open. I think that probably a good introduction and then we start from there. Absolutely. So, um, actually, the panelists did a really, really great job of hitting most of the points that we wanted to get to. What I'd like to do is ask one question that I'd like um, for, as it makes sense for you to answer, um, and then open it up to the audience to, to engage, because they have a lot of rich history. This is, you know, years and years and years of people engaging with the community. And in fact, you'll notice in the comments, I'm sure you did, that um, a lot of the lessons that um, uh, Dr. Robinson had talked about, the com connecting with the community, you know, definitely connecting globally from, from the uh, French television team, um, but also learning to pivot. And so getting back to that, learning to pivot, we've had conversations, and actually Nick kind of alluded to this, of connecting with the community or engaging with the community. And sometimes, a lot of the times, uh, we're surprised because you go into the community with the intention of teaching something. But as a result of getting into the community, you recognize that it's a learning, uh, it's a learning opportunity. It is a two-way street. Um, and there are a lot of opportunities to learn and pivot, fail a little bit, and do something different. And so what I'd like each of you to, to address, um, you know, however briefly, is uh, you know, how that process has gone for you. So uh, Brian, start. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's absolutely a two-way street with something like our impact challenge. If anything, it's the learning is coming more in the other direction. Our mm -hmm. students uh, make that engagement with the community really the core of their learning. Um, so, you know, when we got to the beginning of this process of trying to create a business idea that we could actually create in the city, um, 
you know, we could have approached that in a couple of ways. One is getting our students in a room to go through a brainstorming process where they're taking their previous knowledge, their previous assumptions, um, you know, bringing a lot of great minds together because we have 450 students together at the same time and developing a great idea that may or may not actually work. Mm -hmm. um, the alternative, the approach that we take is from the outset of the brainstorming process, we actually get our students on 14 different yellow school buses, head down to the city, and uh, just as an example, this year we had our students spread across eight different sites. We had some students midtown, downtown, trying to get a real good sense of the entrepreneurial landscape that they were trying to connect Detroit, this next generation of Detroiters with. Um, we had some students with Goodwill Industries trying to get a better understanding of, of job force or career force development, um, workforce development. But then we had five, at the same time, five different neighborhood level events happening. Um, so we were in Brightmoor, we were in Osborne, East Jefferson, Hope Village, University District, and working with a variety of partners there to basically give our students an opportunity to interview, you know, people who are going to be end users. So we had groups of students that just spent the whole day um, with youth, doing similar things to what Nick described, playing soccer, um, you know, doing some creative projects, trying to create music videos, just doing things to try to, again, develop more of that human understanding and a relationship. We had other groups of students who were um, conducting stakeholder interviews. So they were talking with business leaders from that community, neighborhood level um, leaders, uh, parents. Um, and so, you know, when our students came back, they were working in groups of 75. Have you ever tried to accomplish anything with 75 people? <laughs> it's a very difficult process. Uh, but what was important to us is when those groups of 75 came back, they had this 500, this five neighborhood uh, understanding of, uh, of Detroit that they didn't have before. Um, they had this understanding of the entrepreneurial ecosystem and some of the unique challenges of workforce development in, in the city of Detroit specifically. Um, and so when they got to their brainstorming, they were actually informed. It wasn't just their previous experience or their, or their assumptions. Um, they were actually informed by developing relationships and having these complex conversations in the city. Um, in the next day, so they, they generated what they thought were some really good ideas. We had about 40 ideas at one point. And the next morning, we brought those same community leaders um, and parents and high school kids onto our campus to basically hear our students present ideas. And um, we've done this now two years in a row, and it's a, it's a pretty hilarious process because our students think they've got it figured out, and then they're just devastated by the very important feedback they receive, you know, because in, all, in many cases, they're nowhere near the mark in terms of developing a business idea that would actually work in the city. Um, and so at every step, we engage the, the community and community leaders in this process so that by the time we get to a final business idea that we're going to invest in, um, not only, you know, financially, but we're going to invest our time in for the next year, we've got an idea that we know can actually have legs because it was created by the community itself. Um, so... I think that's getting at the question. I probably talked too long. My apologies. Uh, so what have you learned? Uh, well, in, in, in hiring the initial staff, uh, we're on a college campus. It's very diverse, so we knew we needed to have uh, different types of people there to cut everybody's hair, right, every texture of hair. And uh, we wanted our customers to be comfortable coming in and seeing somebody that looked like them to get their hair cut initially. What happened was we found out, you know, when, when this person's busy, uh, and you can't get in with the person that, that, that looks like you, you'll try someone else because you've, you've come a few weeks, you saw that person cut hair. Uh, so it wasn't originally, you know, the, the intention to say, hey, we're going to break these racial barriers. We saw that start to happen. We saw people start to become friends with people they may not normally ever interact with. Um, and, and then they start to understand that uh, they have the same values, the same interests and things like that. Um, so So our clients taught us that you know, this is something that, they, that they've that they wanted. Maybe they didn't know they wanted right away, but started to, you know, uh, ask questions and hang out together and uh, kind of break those barriers. And then in the shop talks, uh, we found that people want to interact physically, right? They want to have these, they want to be able to have a place to ask these questions. And so uh, that that's kind of two of the things that, that we've learned is, you know, uh, these racial barriers being broken and people wanting to experience different things uh, and then have questions answered by people that have actually done what they're trying to do. Um, and, and we've just taken this, like I said, traditional barbershop experience and kind of given, given it a format 
uh, to to meet those to meet those needs. You know, you, you know they, they teach you in uh, in B school and any entrepreneurship class you ever take that in starting a business, it's location, location, location. It's a great um, problem that we have, both Sebastian and I have been in Midtown, is that Midtown is a great location, location, location. Uh, conversely, it is a meritage and mixture of people of all races, backgrounds, economic persuasion, religious orientations. Um, and so for us, we have about 890 sellable square feet. And uh, we have been challenged with trying to uh, inventory a store that has um, transplants that are moving here from Germany mm -hmm. to uh, the African-American inner city kid down the street who goes to Cass Technical High School, um, to anybody who is moving into this epicenter um, in Detroit, whatever is in this period of growth, is moving into this midtown area. So trying to have a, a store that meets the needs of all these different people has been challenging but fun. You know, uh, when we're going through clothes, and my, and my wife, I'm asking my wife, like, there's no way in the world you're going to keep that pair of boots. And then somebody walks in and says, oh, my gosh, I've been looking for those pair of boots all my life. It's <laughs> <laughs> happened time after time again. And so um, we heard before about that ability to be able to pivot. I had this expectation, this idea of the store will be will be run and stocked a certain way, um, but it's not our store. We belong to the community. They're going to tell us how they want the store to be inventoried and stocked, and so that's been fun. Uh, a, a little tension at time, letting go of those reins because I had this idea about how we want the store to be uh, uh, to be arrayed. Um, but it's always fun when, when you get these, you know, these people requesting things that you never thought you'd hear from, but that you bring it in and, and it moves. So um, that part has been, has been pretty exciting. <laughs> yeah. I guess some of the big things that I have learned is that relationships that are meaningful take time, and you never know who those people are who are going to form that relationship. So that each time I talk to a group of people, I don't know if it's someone in the back or someone in the front, but I, I have to assume that everybody is a potential ally. And some of the students I've had who seem like the biggest knuckleheads are the ones who, who stick through it, you know, who come in in the beginning and say something. I think, how could you be so ignorant? Where does that come from? Where is that possible? And over time, they reveal themselves to be genuine people who are interested in their willingness to stumble out and say something that you know, might not be perfectly thought out or completely correct at the time will help you know, reveal themselves as someone who's willing to try. The other is that they're, they're competing goals sometimes at times in the social entrepreneurial model. The traditional sort of risk and return curve doesn't work as well when you need to think about capacity building over a longer arc of time. How do we know that investing in a young person's formative years in education play out well ten, until 10 years down the line? So quarterly returns won't work as well on that. So I started in with sort of big E, lots of post-its, Let's get an idea out fast and make it happen. And it's shifted to a, a big S for social, that the relationship building takes precedent over the, um, init the entrepreneurial initiative. But it's all part of a stronger foundation for something that will resonate with the people who are forming it. These are really fantastic insights. Um, right now, I'd like to invite uh, people in the audience to, take, to have questions. Go ahead. Okay, so with each question, I'm going to repeat it just again to make sure that we have our entire audience be, um, be cognizant of the question. So um, he just asked about best practices uh, for you know, building relationships with the community. Uh, so my, I guess mine is to, to not, have, not to go in expecting something, not to show up and say, I want to do this, we're going to do this. So to take time to say, the first time we meet, we're just going to get to know each other. I want to hear... I want you to hear how I speak, and you hear, we, vice versa, we hear what each other believes in without expecting anything's going to come of it. And the more time you can take to do that, the more you get to say, I really like working with this person, or I don't like working with this person, but at least I know where they stand, and that's also useful. So the time in building those and, and going to the place where people are. So not expecting everybody to use email, 
which I think is a university disease that assumes <laughs> that they didn't write back to me. Showing up at someone's door or calling or also making it so that you make an effort to come meet the person that, because you're asking some of someone their time and their expertise and in a busy life, why would they give that to someone they don't know? We, we have an initiative that we are launching this holiday season with uh, COTS, the Coalition of Temporary Shelters, called a Good Measure Campaign uh, from the biblical uh, Bible where it says, Give and it shall be given unto you a good measure. Um, the thing that we have found um, that has allowed us to be accepted in the community is to not come in to the community to take something but to give. Um, I, I guess we can kind of talk our way around uh, the biggest conversations going on in Midtown about this gentrification. Mm -hmm. And I think the problem that the natives uh, who have been there the entire time feel as if they're being marginalized. Mm -hmm. And I can understand that where, where that's coming from. There, there, there are people who can you know, draw a conclusion, good, bad, on both sides of the discussion. But one of the things that we have to do as entrepreneurs and for the big businesses and small business alike is we need to not marginalize the people who've been there and we need to look to the community to give as opposed as, as opposed to have bring this idea that we're doing something for you, but it's together that we can build a earnest and developing community. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just ask for one more question because we don't have that much time and maybe you can integrate um, anything else in that. I'll go with the back and if we do it quickly, maybe we can get to it, so go ahead. My question is, Given your individual journeys and your objectives, what's your global strategy to implement your objectives? What's your way to connect with your customers, with the community, and with you to help build what you are, what you're doing right now? Okay, so the question, and and I might be paraphrasing inaccurately, is basically given the objectives that you have, what are what are your, given your experiences, what are your larger objectives for connecting with youth um, in a fluid manner? Is that in an mobile way, given, of course, that, that youth are kind of oriented towards mobile. Yeah. Um, so for us, you know, uh, I think the barbershop has traditionally been very inconvenient, you know what I mean? Uh, it's inconvenient to go in and wait and, you know, uh, wait for hours, spend your whole day trying to get a haircut. Um, that takes 20 minutes. So for us, we're looking to build uh, a website, uh, one that engages several different communities, uh, uh, so they can experience the shop talk, you know, that doesn't limit our capacity within the shop. Um, and then building relationships, right? Uh, I, I think, I think, so going to your question, I think you have to be genuinely interested in people or communities uh, uh, in order to engage in them. I do that by asking genuine questions and being genuinely interested in whoever I'm looking to work with. Um, so building a website is going to really help us our building, building the type of website we need is going to really help us scale our business. Uh, the barbershop experience is really interesting, and we're trying to take this physical experience and create content around this, this well-groomed lifestyle uh, that a lot of people, young men specifically, are looking for in my community, right? So uh, what, is, what does it look like to be well-groomed? Uh, we'll, you know, And we want to show examples of that um, uh, through our website. And... You know, you get a lot of young men coming in the shop. Uh, one particular, his name is Gerald. He's a boxer. He's, uh, I think, 11th grade student. He started a sandwich company. I think he just connected with Noam not, not too long ago. People are coming into the shop and they're looking at the barber like, you know, uh, this mentor type of figure. And the social club is that community hub that has the connections to all these different organizations and people directly because they're calling us to get a service. We've positioned ourselves to do that. Now we have to put that online or on some mobile application to, 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 to make it more accessible, like a real social club network. So um, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to engage another question or have another question go on. But I want to, uh, first of all, invite you and challenge you um, to recognize in the conversations that we're having here that this is a form of innovation that perhaps you haven't seen a lot of. This is innovation of an experience. You've seen innovation of products, you've seen kind of technical things going around, but this is innovation of experience. 
And really it's about engaging with people. That's where that innovation happens. So if you could please join me in thanking our panel for their insight. And I, um, and I definitely invite you, I believe they're gonna be around for a little while to um, come up and, and uh, ask the questions directly. Thank you so much. I'm Detroit uh, now, and I'm very proud of it. Uh, transportation was a big thing that was a problem for me. This was just like a, hey, this is not okay. Does anybody know this is broken? 